Hi everyone, my name is Mary Catherine O'Reilly Ginhart. I am a moral theologian and Christian ethicist, as well as a doctoral candidate at the University of Glasgow and an adjunct professor at Cabrini University in the United States. I'm here today to talk with you about St. Francis of Assisi, his life, his spirituality, and what we can take from it and learn. St. Francis is one of my favorite saints for many reasons. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I hope to see you soon. God bless. And I want to make sure to incorporate different aspects of the life of St. Francis of Assisi that would interest whether it's someone that doesn't know any information about St. Francis of Assisi, whether it's someone that maybe knows a little bit, someone that uh, maybe has no academic background in anything other than maybe hearing this person's name. So this presentation is geared towards everyone and everyone is most welcome. So I'm so excited for you to join me today and as we go through this journey together. And I uh, I'd hope that maybe you have a pen and paper with you. If you have any questions, I'd be really happy to answer them at the end of this. And also we're gonna do a little exercise during this presentation because it wouldn't be a Mary Catherine presentation without a little work as we go along. So um, that'll come at the end. But what I want to start with is an introduction to certain Catholic terms. So we're dealing with a saint. His name is Francis. And I'll get to talk about his life. Um, and his actual name is not Francis, which is really funny, I find. Um, but we're going to learn a lot about who he was. And also, at the end of this presentation, where you can take this information. So a lot of my students will say, Professor Eichenhardt, this is great, okay? I've learned something, but what does this matter to me? This saint lived over 800 years ago. So we're gonna journey through this together and you're gonna be able to take away what this can mean for your daily life, whether you're joining us from Scotland. I know we have people joining us from India today, from Australia, from the United States. So we're all around the world to, to listen today about St. Francis of Assisi. So. I hope you enjoy it. And the first step on our journey is we're gonna be talking about him as a person and also certain Catholic terms. Now, when I talk about Catholic terms, we're talking in a time period of the late 1100s and early 1200s. So the entire church or Christianity for that matter was Catholic. So uh, that's why if you hear me talk about Catholic terms and so on and so forth, that's why we're talking about it. So. I have written down some terms, so don't worry, you're not gonna be schooled on this later. This is not why you need a pen and paper, but a term that we first come across is faith. Now, what does faith mean, okay? So faith, and, and I've written these down to help, to help you understand um, in simplistic terms what these terms can mean. So faith, when a man or woman completely submits his or her intellect and his or her will to God. So that's having a, a complete trust in the process, in, in understanding what God is, who God is. And for many of us joining today from across the world, we may have different concepts of God, or you might call it a higher power. Um, and for St. Francis of Assisi, we're talking about Jesus Christ. We're talking about um, for Christianity, for, so for that religion. So faith, that's a really a key word. St. Francis of Assisi was a friar. So what is a friar? A friar comes from the Latin word meaning brother, a term that refers to a person who belongs um, to a mendicant order. Okay, so now you're gonna say, okay, Mary Catherine, now you've given me another term. What does that mean? So I'm gonna continue as you see now with just a couple terms to get us started so that you have a little bit of vocabulary for our journey. So we now know what faith is, we know what a friar is, and um, the mendicants were, that comes from a Latin term that's a uh, that's type of a religious order. So you might have heard of the Franciscans. That's because of St. Francis of Assisi. You have the Benedictines. That's because of St. Benedict. So these are religious orders, which is a group of men or women that come together um, that have lived in either towns or cities. These are uh, mendicants, not monks. We're gonna get to what a monk is. So they, li they lived in towns or cities and they lived a simplistic life and they, they um, performed ministry when it was needed. So a monk, so that's a mendicant. So you have a friar, they're part of 
a mendicant in order. Does that make sense? And then you have so what is different is a monk. Now, a monk um, is that was coined even earlier. And a monk is a person that withdraws and secludes themselves to live a simplistic life that um, is full of prayer and is full of spiritual discipline that is in the outside world. So St. Francis of Assisi lived in a town called Assisi. So he was in a, in a town, he wasn't super secluded where he was away from everyone. So that's the difference. So he's not a monk, he's a friar. And a friar is in a mendicant order, okay? He was also a mystic. So what is a mystic, okay? We're almost done with the vocab list and then we'll get on to our journey. But this is important to know. So a mystic or mysticism in general is a spiritual phenomenon that expresses itself in a direct intense experience of the union and oneness with God. Generally, the mystical journey consists of three phases. So the first phase is purgation, which is cleansing of sin. Now sin is, uh, you can define that in many ways, but it, it basically means when uh, you're cut off from God. There's say whether it's an action, there's different types of sin, you know, knowing what you're doing and you still do it or not knowing the full implications and in your intentionality, but it's when a behavior and action happens and that cuts you off from God. So so if, if you're going to be a mystic, and we're talking mysticism, the first step is purging yourself from that. So purging yourself from, from sinfulness. The second step of this three-step process is illumination. That's attraction to all things that are God. So that's um, doing acts of service or acts of kindness and, and really connecting yourself to God. So it's cleansing, then connecting yourself to God, and then it's union. So a complete oneness with God. So that is mysticism. That is a, a person that goes through this phenomenon and can experience on a different level an experience with God. They go through, through these three steps. Now, St. Francis of Assisi was not only a friar, he was also a mystic. He had spiritual um, experiences that uh, are only can be defined as mystical experiences. So we're almost done. And uh, another word that I'd like you to know for our journey today is the word grace. Now, grace is a freely unmerited assistance given to human beings by God for their salvation. It is participation in the life of God. Wherever you're from today, if you don't have a spiritual background, if you're not in you know, a, a certain organized religion, you might have just heard the word grace, you know, whether you're culturally from a certain country, like in America, we have Amazing Grace, that's a song. You hear the word grace a lot, and that's what it means, what I've just defined it as. So grace is, it's a gift. It's a gift from God that connects you to God, that helps your, your spiritual connection, and it's freely given by God. And so to understand now of mysticism, a friar, and this man, because remember, he's human. So we're dealing with a man that is human, like you and me. So he experiences, or he did, he experienced everything that we experienced as humans. He was a, a young man. He grew up in a family, which I'm now going to tell you about. But I want you to understand that we're talking, you know, about someone that is real, like you and I, that lived on this earth that had a truly unique life, but a simplistic life. And he lived it and wanted to um, show others how you could live a life with God, but in simple terms, okay? So now on our, we're now done the vocab list, so don't worry, you won't be quizzed. But we're now gonna move on to who St. Francis of Assisi was. So St. Francis of Assisi, he was not named Francis, as I've said before. He was born Giovanni de Pietro di Bernardone, and that was in 1181 to 1182. They're not really sure exactly the year he was born. So his name was Giovanni, that was his baptismal name. Giovanni is the Italian for John. Okay, so you're probably like, why wasn't he St. John of Assisi, right? Well, his father, he was a Frenchman, his father, right? And his father, or excuse me, his father was Italian, his mother was French, and his father, though, worked in France. He was a silk merchant. So his father would travel to France a lot, and um, when he came back, 
uh, he was born, St. Francis of Assisi was born when his father was away and his father came back and his father loved French, well, France so much and his French wife that he used to give a nickname to Giovanni, which was Francesco. So Francesco means, well, Francis in English, but colloquial back then, it meant Frenchman. So his father, who married a French woman, worked in France, loved all things French, so Nick's, nicknames his son um, Francesco, and the name stuck. So that's why we have Francesco or Francis. So um, Francis grew up in a house uh, where he, he was wealthy. His parents, um, his mother was a homemaker and his father was a silk merchant. So his father had a market and sold um, garments, cloth, and would go and travel and sell at other markets. So he grew up with um, friends. He grew up as an average, you know, boy, but wealthy. And he had friends. He enjoyed the simple pleasures of life where he's, hanging out with friends, uh, enjoying the troubadours. So that was uh, listening to um, uh, medieval lyrics, poetry being read. He, he enjoyed his youth. And it also is written that he enjoyed the simple pleasures as a young man. So we don't really know what that means because it's not spelled out X, Y, and Z. But I think for some of us, we might could guess what that means. So we're not talking about a person that from birth becomes this holy, holy person, dies this holy, holy person. We're talking about a person like you and I, a man that had parents, grew up, had friends, had a life, was doing different things, and then something changes. And what changes is he, um, he started to, to kind of to, to wonder and to think, is, is, is there more to life? And there is a story about how he's in the marketplace and he's helping his father sell cloth. Now, his father, um, we don't know much other than that his father was supposedly a nice guy. He, uh, he gave alms to the poor at some point, but it was nothing more than the average person, what the average person did. And uh, Francis was selling garments one day and a beggar comes along and the beggar you know, is there and he's, and he's, he's asking for money. And, and Francis gives him something, but not much. And then something touches Francis's soul and he runs after the beggar and he gives the beggar everything he has in his pockets and, and all the money he has and, and everything that's on him at the time as well. And then the beggar is really thankful and Francis then goes back to his, his father and his father's really upset because Francis gives all the money he had on him and also extra family money that he had. And so at that point, Francis is, there's something that connects to him. It connects to him that there, there's something more to this life. And after that, Francis, um, he goes and he joins the military. This is in about 1202. So remember he's born 1181, 1182. And he eventually, he dies in 1226. So he dies at 44 years old. So we're now in 12, um, 1202. So he joins the military and he's captured. And he goes through this experience while being captured where he reevaluates his life and where he is. And we then get to a point where Francis is wondering, you know, again, is there more to life? And so he comes back to um, Assisi, and then he goes to um, on a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage is a, a, a special journey, uh, usually religiously oriented, to experience the faith. Now, there's pilgrimages in different religions, not just in Christianity, but he goes on a pilgrimage to Rome. And he's at this um, Basilica of St. Peter, and he's begging. He's begging on the street with the beggars. He finds a connection to these, to these people, and, and then... Then he leaves his pilgrimage, he comes back, and he goes again to, um, to go out to the military. This is, he relists in the army. This is in 1205. And um, he comes back, and there's something with him that hasn't, he's not settled yet, you know? And uh, he then has, he's praying back in Assisi, he's returned, he's praying, and he has a mystical experience. Now, I, I've talked to you about the word, what a, a mystic is, what mysticism is, right? He has a mystical vision of Jesus Christ. And the vision is that Christ says to him, Francis, Francis, go and repair my house, which you see is falling into ruins. 
Now, Francis was in um, a chapel at this time, um, San uh, Domenico, and he's thinking, this means exactly what Christ is saying to me. He means physically fix this church. That's how Francis interprets it. So Francis hears Jesus and he says, okay. So he goes and he starts to, to sell his father's um, cloth to get money. So then he does that behind his father's back and he gives the money to the priest to fix up this church where he prayed and he had this vision. Now his father's furious because this is not the first time Francis has done something like this. And also the priest at the time wouldn't accept his money. So Francis is in this like, what do I do? I, I, I want to help. And I'm trying to help. I'm trying to do the right thing. And he's wrestling. And you can see that it's like a spiritual restlessness that he's having. So what he decides to do is um, he, he, he knows that he wants to live a life different than the life he's been given. And his father is so angry with the amount of money that he effectively stole from his father that he believes the restitution to pay his father back would to be to forgo his inheritance because remember in the beginning i said he was a wealthy guy well his their family was wealthy so uh, francis was wealthy so francis is okay with that and he then um decides that he will beg so remember i told you about the experience he had at saint peter's basilica in rome about begging so he um starts to beg to beg for his um money for not only to fix up the church but this is now his new way of life and in this time being he went on a retreat in assisi there's um if you go to assisi which i'm going to show you some pictures in a minute there is a small cave at the top um just above the town where saint francis would go to pray and he stayed there for a month when he was trying to figure out you know what is god really calling me to do and um, in that month, he realized that from what is written about it, that he, he had a life, he was destined for a life that would be different. And so he comes back to the town and that's again, when he picks up begging and he'll use the begging and the money he makes to um, fund not only, I'm gonna talk to you about the Port Sincala, which is, and I have pictures of that, which is where he had another mystical experience, but. Um, he funded all these little uh, churches, or you call them maybe little chapels around Assisi. So um, he, he goes on to really now create this own kind of his new life. And um, other people are really inspired by who he is and what he's doing, because people are kind of recognizing, hey, wait, you know, like Giovanni is now Francesco. They're recognizing he gave up his wealth. He's begging. And he has this spiritual essence about him, this spirit that, that people are interested in. Why? Why would you give up everything? Why would you live a life of this simplistic life to honor God in that way? Why can't you just keep your possessions and, and continue to live as you were living and just give a little bit to the poor? And I'm simplifying this, but this is, you know, the idea of, of what's going on. So... Um, he starts to collect money from begging, as I said, and he rebuilds San um, Domenico, and then he restores the several chapels, which I'm t I told you about, and there's this, which I'm going to cut to now, um, of a couple slides I have, of the Port Sincala, which is this beautiful little um, church, and they've built now a church around it. So I'm going to, I'll be still on your screen, but I'm going to cut to the um, Port Sincala, and that was in uh, 1208. So remember, we're following a timeline of 1205, he's in the army, right? So, and then he comes back. So this is three years of trying to figure out really what his life is like. So I'm going to share my screen now and go to this, um, these pictures. So as you can see here, so this is a CC, if you can see my pointer here. So I went to a CC in 1998 and then twice in 2018. So when you get to the town, that big church up here, that is the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi. And I'm going to get to the Ports and Colonies in a second, but I want to give you now, I've told you a little bit about his life. I want to give to you uh, a little, I guess, knowledge of what we're talking about. I'm a visual learner, so I like to, to see these things. So this is when you're walking up to the town, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing a beautiful, uh, a beautiful, not only a monument to St. Francis of Assisi, but 
the architecture for that time period. They built this right after he died in the um, mid 1200s. And it's breathtaking. I mean, the view is breathtaking if you go on a really nice day in general. But, and this is the path. So I came in from the train station to Assisi, and I'm going to talk to you about the Port Sincala in a second. But you have to walk up this really steep hill. And, and it's funny because you, you don't, when you first get to a CC, and even if you have Google Maps, you think, yeah, it's not that far. It's like, you know, the Irish say it's just down the road. And what just down the road means is like two and a half miles long. So this was about two and a half miles from the train station. So you're walking up there and you get to this beautiful town of a CC just out of a picture book. And now I took, and these are all pictures I've taken. Everything on the slide I've, I've taken myself, except there are two pictures or three, which I'll tell you that are not mine. So I took this picture. This is the Basilica. So when you come up, this was built again after he died, but I'm going to show you the little chapel that he prayed in. So this was again built after, and it was inspired by who he was. It's funny because he was a man who lived so simplistically, and they built this huge, huge church. And there's me to give a view of, you know, it's huge, this place. Okay, so you go in and the paintings within this chapel are unbelievable. It is a spiritual experience that you will probably cannot compare it to anything else in your life because the magnitude of the artwork and the serenity and the quietness that you feel, experience, and see is truly like nothing I've ever experienced. And again, this was built right after he died. So we're talking about, um, about well, it was right after, so a couple of years, but then its completion wasn't for a little while later. But we're, stuck, we're talking within the same 50, 75 years of that time period in the 1200s. Okay? This was all done before the Sistine Chapel. So I'm going to talk about that in a second, but what I want to get to first is the Port Sincala, and then I'll go back to this, okay? So here is, here is, it's called the Church of St. Mary the Angels, okay? So there are two really important churches in Assisi. The one I just showed you was built after he died, okay? But this is important for right now. This was, this big church, which you see on your screen, is St. Mary the Angels, right? But this, you see that little beautiful Port Sincala? That is the Port Sincala where St. Francis of Assisi prayed in. They built this huge church around this little church. But, and I've taken these pictures. So, you're, um, so you can see that this is where St. Francis of Assisi prayed in that little chapel there. I didn't take this picture because you're not allowed to take pictures inside, but when you go in, this is exactly what it looked like, minus the, the wooden pews there of where he prayed. This little chapel is, that it was his favorite chapel, he writes, that he helped restore. And the spiritual experience, if you've ever heard of Simone Weil, who is a theologian, she experienced a spiritual experience that transformed her spirituality in this chapel and people from all over the world no matter what religion creed spirituality come to meditate here because it is supposed to be a place of just not only tranquil experience but a place where you can really feel the presence of god or your higher power whatever however you spiritually connect and this is a, um, this was there. I mean, when St. Francis of Assisi was alive, this was there. This is what he looked at and what he prayed to, okay? So I'm going to get to the other photos in a second, but what I want to, I'm going to just stop the share for a second. What I want to express to you is um, St. Francis was a man that wanted things simple, okay? And you see how you saw that tiny um, uh, Port Sincala. He prayed in that. And that was, um, again, a chapel that he rebuilt. And that was where his followers first came to pray together. And it was in that chapel that I just showed you, the little, the little one, where in 1208, there was a mass that was being said. And he heard the story of... Um, of the gospel of, of go and be in communion with each other. So St. Francis heard that and his followers heard that. And it was at that point that he decided that he wanted to create an order 
uh, to live a life, a simplistic life in the name of God with one another. So the following year, he goes to Rome in 1209, and he goes to Rome and he asks Pope Innocent III for a, um, a, a papal, whether it be a papal bull or a papal authoritative uh, assignment that allows him to create this order along with his followers. So that took some time and some working out. Um, and it was officially then granted a little while later that he could create a whole new order to pray to God in a way and set out rules, they're called, in a way that he believed would honor God and that they could live by. And you can Google the rule of, um, of St. Francis of Assisi and it will tell you about it. There's also the rule of St. Augustine. Augustine lived in the late 300s, died in 430 AD. You know, we're talking, you know, a thousand plus years before St. Francis of Assisi. So this wasn't the first rule or the first religious order, but this religious order was different, extremely different because of the simplicity and you might hear, oh, well, Mary Catherine, don't they have to take, don't priests have to take, you know, obedience, poverty, chastity? So aren't they all the same? They're not all the same because there are religious orders that will take on extra rules, extra, or um, in some ways, uh, if it's not extra, it kind of offshoots of their personal goal. So for example, um, the Augustinians are a religious order that really pride themselves on community, living in community and helping community. The Jesuits are really known for education, going out and educating around the world. And that is one of the primary purposes of who they are and their spirituality. So I'm just giving very general examples. So the Franciscans, which they're now called, uh, are known for their simplistic way of life. So I'm going to go back now to the... Um, the PowerPoint here to show you. I'm going to show you Saint. This is actually so. Here you see here, that is the um, that is the tunic that Saint Francis of Assisi wore. That is his. That is his actual tunic. And if you can see, I tried to. This is I took this photo. I took these photos myself. If you see the patchwork there, do you see that patchwork? Saint Francis of Assisi refused to buy new clothes. He refused to live a life that was excessive. We're talking about a man whose father uh, was Italian, his mother was French, his father was a silk merchant, had the best cloth that you could imagine, right? This is a young man that grew up probably with the best clothes that you and I could ever dream of, right? And he, this is, this is what he died in. This is his tunic. He refused to ever buy a new tunic once he, he um, and there's different names for tunics. That's not the only one. There's, it's also called a scapular. It's also called, um, uh, what's the other word? I'm, I'm blanking on it now, but there's different, a cassock. Sorry, that's the word I'm thinking of. There are different cloth terms to mean different uh, ways of how people wear it or um, the color or for the the type of celebration but i call this a tunic now there might be a better word for it but that's what i refer to it as anyway so you see the the patchwork here so saint claire if you've ever heard of claire saint claire she was also an assisi now i don't have time to talk about her but my point is that she actually helped him sew this together um and they had a they had a, a friendship where she was um a woman she was then became in her own order of Franciscans and uh, a nun and she would help sew him because he didn't know how to sew. So she helped sew these patches so he would never buy a new cloth. He would keep sewing together what he had. That's how simplistic we're talking about. St. Francis of Assisi also, it is said that he did not own a Bible because he refused to own a Bible. He didn't want to own anything. So he would rent, I kid you not, he would rent a Bible to use um, and to to worship from because he didn't want to own anything. That's how simplistic we're talking. Now I need to kind of speed up a bit so we can get to some other interesting, I could go on and on about all of this for so long, but we don't have all that time, much time. So um, I want to now talk about here, I just want to show you some other photos of um, this. I couldn't take a photo of this, I had to get off online and it's pretty blurry, but this is, and they don't allow you to have any photography at the tomb. This is the tomb. So again, it's extremely blurry, but it's the best one I could find. Um, in this, when you come into the doors, 
Here is where St. Francis lies, and it actually has a, in Italian, it has a plaque that says that. So he's here behind the altar. So here's the altar, right? And he's behind that here. And you walk around, back and around here, and there are other tombs in here of early Franciscans and other people, okay? So you come here and you pray, and there behind, I mean, in front of it, excuse me, are pews, okay? And people will pray, and at 1245, every day, I was there. This is the Angelus that they pray in Italian to um, in honor of St. Francis of Assisi, and they pray that every day. Not now, obviously, due to the pandemic, but every day that they're open, they pray. And I'm sure they do it, you know, now, not at the tomb, but solitary um, in the places that they live. So you walk around, when you go in, you walk around, you can lay a flower. So usually there are um, white roses that you can put here and, um, or a candle, you can um, give a, an offertory for a candle to have your candle be lit later and pray, you know, whatever for that intention. And you walk up, you either lay a flower or a candle here, and then you continue to walk around. Now, when you get over about this side over here where my mouse is, there is, um, there's always Franciscans everywhere, but there's a Franciscan there. And if you can make a donation to the um, Franciscan order, they'll give you a card. Now, I'm a person, if you meet me in, in, in person, I'll probably give you a prayer card. And I had, I think I had, I gave, I donated whatever I donated, and they gave me about 10 prayer cards, right? And I don't actually have any to show you of what they are like, because I've given them all out. And I was trying to find one. I was going through all my things, and I couldn't find one to show you. But um, it's a beautiful picture of St. Francis, and it has the prayer on the back. So um, I want to now move on to, and there's a lot of different I mean, that's my personal experience that I had. Everyone that goes may have a different experience, but to me, to be able to go there, pray at the tomb, and receive a prayer card from a Franciscan, it was, it was just beautiful. And also, um, they call St. Francis of Assisi, the, and I'm just gonna put you back to me, so you don't have to keep looking there, but uh, they call St. Francis of Assisi the second Christ. Now, why do they call him the second Christ is because of how he lived. I showed you his tunic, right? I showed you the patchwork. And, uh, and I also, I don't think I'll have time, but um, I have, and I can send it out later if you're interested, of different photographs of the exact chalice he used to say mass. That's there. I have a photo of that. And again, he didn't want to own anything, right? So, but they called him the second Christ because he was so simplistic in how he lived and he lived for love and love of one another. He said it was better to love than to be loved. Um, and I'm gonna read you at the end of the presentation, the St. Francis of Assisi prayer that I love, um, that talks about, you know, it's better to do for others than to have things done for yourself. And that way of life, that, that just selflessness is, is why they called him the second Christ. And also, if, um, I don't know if you've heard of the current Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. His name is Pope Francis. Now, his real name is not Francis. His real name is um, Jorge Bercoliolio, and he's from Argentina. But he chose, he was the first Pope in the Roman Catholic Church to ever take the name Francis. And he took the name Francis for many reasons, but it is said that right when he became Pope in the Sistine Chapel, someone turned to him and said, please don't forget about the poor. And then when uh, he was thinking about taking a name, this is what is said to have gone on, that's who he thought of was the, the second Christ, which is St. Francis of Assisi, the, the, the saint of the poor. And you hear a lot about St. Francis of the patron saint of animals. He's written different spiritual books on um, you know, animals and the love of nature. He's also the patron saint of Italy, the patron saint of ecology. And he is a man that is known for not only his sim simple life, but he's also a human. And I stress that to my students a lot. And I'm gonna get to the last part now, which is what can you take from, from learning all I told you about St. Francis of Assisi to your own life? And I have four takeaways. So this would be where you get your pen and paper out. If you wanna think of how you can do um, the life of St. Francis in your own life. So you don't have to write these down, but I just think it's helpful. So we're talking about a man who lived a very simple life. Now, how, how do you incorporate that in your life? He's a man that lived over 800 years ago. Um, 
you know, he lived in a complete, he didn't have Wi-Fi, he didn't have, you know, the current, you know, situations of our life today. But the one thing that he had was a will, a will to do, you know, whether it be the right thing, whether it be the kind thing, whether it be the, the act of, of God, he had a choice. And each one of us, every single day when we get up, we have a choice to make. And that's to live for others or to live for ourselves, I believe. And so these are the four takeaways. These are the Mary Catherine O'Reilly Ginhart takeaways of St. Francis of Assisi. So the first one is simplicity. Keep it simple. Now, there's an acronym that I have. It's called Keep It Simple Sunshine. Okay? KISS. Keep It Simple Sunshine. When I was a kid, they had a different word at the at the bottom, but I think sunshine is extremely positive, which I really like because I'm an extremely positive person. So kiss. Keep it simple, sunshine. Keep your life simple. Try not to overcomplicate things. Easier said than done. But a simple life can be a beautiful life. A simple life doesn't mean sell all your possessions, get one tunic, and keep sewing patches to it. Okay, that is not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is take stock in what is important in your life. What adds value to your life? I believe that a diet is not what you physically eat. A diet is what you watch, who you surround yourself with. Of course, yes, your nutrition, but it's also your spiritual diet as well. So if things are not adding value in a positive manner to your life that are enhancing and helping you grow to give back, then maybe they need to be reevaluated to keep it simple. So kiss, keep it simple, sunshine. The second one, acts of kindness, okay? So I try and do three acts of kindness a day. Now, okay, what is an act of kindness? So an act of kindness can be for myself or for others because you can't pour from an empty cup. In order for myself to help someone, whether it be physically, spiritually, financially, whatever that might be, I have to make sure I myself am in a fit spiritual condition, a fit healthy condition, physically, mentally. And so um, I, for myself, I try and exercise every day. And that might sound like crazy. Okay, what does that have to do with St. Francis of Assisi? What that has to do is, is um, St. Francis also talked about the body and image and likeness of God. Each of us, our bodies are a gift from God. So in order for me to honor that, I try and keep fit, try and keep healthy, you know, to keep my stamina up, to, to make sure I can get up every day. And, and so that's for me, everyday exercise. So that's one act of kindness that I do for myself. But another act of kindness in general could be you check in with a loved one. We can't maybe physically see each other now because of the pandemic, but call, phone. And it might sound simple. Oh, and we're, and sometimes we're, we are the people that go, you know, oh, I'll call that person. I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, and then tomorrow comes. And then I'll be like, uh, I'll do it the next day. Like, I got to get this done. So it's make an effort and stop and just do it. Okay. So uh, checking in on loved ones. If you can't physically do it, make a phone call. Um, doing my job or helping someone that needs a job done. That could be right now in the pandemic. Maybe you have a neighbor that can't physically go out for whatever reason to go to the grocery store, to go to the post office, to to check in on their loved one. You know, always ask someone, you know, how are you doing? Do you need help? Are you okay? And it's not a, uh, a flyby kind of comment. It's a, it's, it's, it's a sincere comment. So ask if you really want to know the answer and listen, because if someone's having a bad day and they're going to tell you, you have to take time to listen. The third one, and we're almost coming to an end here, is hope. Okay, so we have simple, the first is simple, keep it simple, stupid, the KISS acronym, right? Then we have acts of kindness, try and be kind every day. I try and do three acts of kindness. You can do whatever you want. Um, hope. Now, St. Francis of Assisi, remember, was a man, a, a guy that had friends. He came from wealthy parents. He chose then a life very different than, than what his parents had set out for him, for what his community had set out for him but he had hope. He had hope that he would have a life that maybe was different than other people, but he always had hope that he would get his job done. 
whether that was finding money to support the chapels, whether that was um, trying to physically help someone in need. He was always well known for the work he did for lepers, where he physically went out and helped people. So um, to, to live without hope, there's a, a famous um, theologian who I'm just going to read you his little quote here by Jurgen Moltmann. It's actually a book. It's called The Experiment Hope by Jurgen Moltmann. It's from 1975, this book. So, and, but I really love it. There's this quote, and here's the quote. It says, totally without hope, one cannot live. Without some goal and some effort to reach it, no man can live. When he has lost all hope and object in life, man often becomes a monster in his misery. To live without hope is to cease to live. Hell is hopeless. So to have hope, that is our third takeaway, okay? If you don't have hope, you're not gonna have much, okay? So have hope. Let's say you're going through a tough time right now. It's a pandemic. We're all experiencing something from this, okay? have hope that whether it be tomorrow or the next day, it, you'll get through this. We will all get through this and it will get better. So have hope. And the last um, takeaway is to embrace, okay? So this is the last one, embrace. St. Francis of Assisi was known to embrace people, no matter who they were, no matter what their background was, no matter how much money, whether they were sick, whether anything about them. He embraced everyone. So um, when we think about embracing, we can connect it, and St. Francis talks about this, about connecting it to um, suffering. So uh, for example, a leper. So it talked about how Francis, St. Francis would comfort a leper. And whoever, whether it be your brother, sister physically, whether it be your neighbors, whether it be whoever that you come across, they are, as in, in the Christian tradition, we say we are all brothers and sisters. So, and when you, um, when you help someone and embrace suffering, in a way, um, you cast that suffering out and you become yourself a mediator of light and you help that person and yourself really find that light together. So, you know, when you embrace suffering and you embrace that person, you embrace God. And for Christians, we call that, then you embrace the suffering of Jesus Christ. So embrace, embrace people and don't feel that uh, you have to solve everyone's problem and you have to do it all in one day because it won't be possible. But if you embrace one another, and especially we're talking about people that are really needing help. And that, um, and I, and I, that could be uh, people dealing with drug and alcohol addiction. That could be someone that's dying or someone that has just lost a loved one and is grieving. That could be people in prisons. That could be um, home, the homeless. That could be estranged. Maybe you have a strange family member. That could be people also in this pandemic that we're talking about. People that for mental health, physical health, isolation, financial security, to embrace ask someone, how are you doing? How can I help you? And, and, and be the light in this world. There is more good in this world than there is bad. And I know that. And I know that if, if you listen to the life and the spirituality of St. Francis of Assisi, a man who came from a family, just like all of us have come from a family in one form or another, grew up, and he made a choice with his life. And, but every day we have a choice. Every day, you can start in the next hour, you can start tomorrow. But to be positive, to, to, um, to go back to keep it simple sunshine, you know, to know that you are so special in this world and that you are so worthy of a beautiful life. And no matter where you've come from, no matter what your past is, no matter what you've gone through, there's always hope. And hope springs eternal. It is always there. And the positivity to create, whether it be a new life, continue in the same things you're doing in, in the life you lead now, but to know that, that God is with you. And I tell my students um, in class, when I teach my intro class, I tell them God is like the ocean. Now my philosopher friends don't like this, but I like it. I say God is like the ocean. 
He's always, he, she's always there. Sometimes you don't feel it. Sometimes you can't see it. Sometimes for me, when I go to the beach, you smell the, the salt in the, in the air. You can't smell it. You can't, but God's there. Just because you don't see God, just because you can't feel God, sometimes God doesn't leave you. Sometimes we, I tell my students, I physically show them the class, I, I'll turn my back on the ocean, you know, but the ocean's still there. Just because I turn my back on it doesn't mean the ocean goes away. So um, to remember that, you know, you're just incredible and you're doing a wonderful job wherever you are in this life. And to close, I'm going to read, um, there's the St. Francis of Assisi prayer, but I'd like to read the Footprints prayer, which doesn't have to do with St. Francis of Assisi, but it connects to this idea of, of love and knowing that God is there. So this is the Footprints prayer. Now this actually prayer card came out of my dad's wallet. My dad is now deceased and he's had this in his wallet since the 1980s. And I found it when I was recently back home um, in Philadelphia um, going through a storage unit. So this is it. And I think it encapsulates um, the message of St. Francis of Assisi. And so to close here it is, it's called Footprints. One night a man had a dream. He dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from his life. For each scene, he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to him and the other to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times in his life. This really bothered him, and he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I have noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why I needed you most when you would leave me. I, I don't understand why when I needed you the most, you would leave me, he says. The Lord replied, my precious, precious child, I love you and I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. So I hope you've enjoyed this um, lecture today, and I hope you learned a little bit about St. Francis of Assisi, and to always know that whatever you're doing, keep it simple sunshine. Thanks so much. That was Thank fantastic. You. Really brilliant. Thank you very much, Mary Catherine. I loved that. Um, loads of questions um, that I have myself. If anybody else would like to ask a question, we have 15, 20 minutes or so, then just raise your hand. And I'm sure Mary Cathy will do her best to answer. But the, the, the last four points that you made were really great, Mary Cathy. The, the purpose of having these talks and experts like yourself coming is so that um, the thousands of hours of learning, of studying, the tens of years of the burning the candle at night time just to learn, the hundreds, possibly thousands of books that you've gave me, that you've read in your time, just an opportunity for us to come and tap into that. And I thought right at the end, the, the four points, keep it simple, sunshine was just a fantastic touch, really brilliant. And, um, and also the, the acts of kindness and then breaking down the three acts of kindness every single day and really just the, like a kindness for yourself exercise and looking at um, keeping it simple diet and tying it in. But really the question that I would like to ask is, you mentioned that um, so Francis, uh, Francis of Assisi was a, a mystic, so he was known as a mystic. And um, then based on some other training that I've done there, who we'll look at uh, mystical type experiences, which he said that he had a number of. And the, the, the modern um, scientists look at, the modern mystics look at, um, if there is a, if a human being can have a mystical experience, then there must be a neurological, a biological and a chemical reaction in the human body that every human being can have. And what always interests me is, is what process would Francis of Assisi have went through? So what technique would it have been prayer? Would it have been meditation? Would it have been contemplation? What was the process that, um, that wakened up in him these experiences that they're describing as mystical? 
Right. Great. Great question, Jed. Thanks so much. So from what I've read, and um, there'll be experts that are that are better to qualify to answer the question than I am, but what I've read is it's through his, it's his selflessness. It's his self-giving. So he was a, a person that it was about the poor. It was about the leper. Now in those times, lepers I mean, no, no one would go near them. They were cast out. And it was going to the people that are cast out, that are, that are abandoned in many ways, that this experience where he felt a connection to God, this, this present, this overwhelming um, relationship, because we all have a personal relationship with God, but for his, he felt when it was doing works for others, when it was praying, he prayed a lot, he meditated, he had a friendship with um, St. Clair of Assisi. And I mean, relationships of friendships of, of your community, you know, he, he had these, um, these group of men that, you know, when they founded the first Franciscan order, working together. So there are so many elements, but prayer was central to who he was. But when I was describing about his life, you know, there wasn't much in the beginning that really told us about his prayer life, about who he was before this experience that he had where God tells him that, you know, Francis, I'm calling you to rebuild my church and to fix it. So, um, so different people have different opinions, but what I would say is um, what connects him is, is his prayer, is praying and, and quietly in that contemplation, that meditation where he went away for a month to that cave where he needed time to, to be by himself and to really evaluate his life. So it's, it's meditation, it's, it's quiet, it's silence sometimes. And in the silence, we hear God's answers, you know? So um, there's many ways to answer that, but I think it's acts of kindness, giving out to others, and really your motives. What are your motives? If you're doing something because you think it's going to make you look good, or you donate, and your name's on a wall, that's not the motive we're looking for. We're looking for really the inner love. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Thank you. There is a few hands come up for questions, so we'll just start with um, Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Jed. Thank you, Jed, um, for organising this. And um, thank you, Mary Catherine. That was um, really, I've not actually got a question. I just wanted to thank you because it was like so thought provoking and it was like so inspiring for me. And I say the St. Francis prayer every single morning and I didn't know his story. Do you know? So I knew he was a humble man and I knew he was a man that, that looked after the poor and stuff but like to hear the whole story was just like it was so I just feel like really like quite in awe do you know that way I'm like oh my god to think that you say something religiously every single day and you're like I didn't even know where that came from so that was beautiful and um and I love the takeaways and I absolutely um I loved your spirit and your <laughs> gentleness but your power that was coming through you too so thank you so much for inspiring me and for making me think a bit more about you know like the um living simpler which is a message that's been coming through for me recently quite a bit so especially in this lockdown because you know you you don't need the things that you think you need so anyway and the kindness the acts of kindness so i'm going to take that away so thank you so much mary catherine it's a pleasure to meet you thank you Thank you, Catherine. Um, we have another question here from Stuart Forsyth. Hi, Stuart. Hi. Hey, how um, are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing, Mary Catherine? So, thanks so much. That was just lovely to hear you. Really, really appreciate that. I have a question for you. Um, uh, there's a, a thing that I picked up a, a few years ago. Uh, a Muslim, a Christian, and a Jew walk into a bar together in northern Israel. That's no joke. You know, and I thought that was it was it was lovely that. I just from that point of view, the practical you as a Roman Catholic and a, a, as a student of Catholicism, and also somebody that carries the message of, of, of your religion. These practical princes of Franciscanism, they're universal, clearly, mm -hmm. and they obviously transcend religious barriers. You know, simplicity, love, kindness, that type of thing. 
with your own uh, love and faith, how are you, and therefore how are we, able to transcend these religious barriers, which are obvious? I live in Glasgow, even in our current city. How are you, uh, 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 as the carrier of that message, and therefore we, able to transcend to, to, to communicate that? Great, uh, thank you so much. That's a wonderful question. Uh, I actually, my uh, other area of expertise is interreligious dialogue. So I actually worked for the Bishop's Conference of Scotland for um, the Roman Catholic Church here in Scotland. for two <coughs> years building a bridge between um, different religious communities, um, especially the Muslim community, Jewish, Sikh, Baha'i, Hindu, and Buddhist community, and, and working together. And what I believe is the most important takeaway of any dialogue, whether you know, you're meeting once every couple months or it's for a certain religious festival, is the point of showing up. All of us have busy lives. You know, All of us have different things going on with work, with personal relationships, family, um, different uh, arrangements or different, I forget the word I'm looking for, but different, uh, activities in our lives, but to show up, I think the most important thing to live out any type of message is showing up and listening. Um, someone once said to me, God gives you, Mary Catherine, two ears, one mouth, and it's to listen a little bit extra. So listening to our brothers and sisters of different faiths, understanding where they're coming from, um, whatever that might be. And, and I've been, um, I've been really lucky that I've been able to go to different places of worship, specifically actually in Glasgow, um, and work with the different communities here on building a bridge of faith. So uh, learning from, I can learn a lot, and Pope Francis came out in February of, I think it was 2019, the Human Fraternity Document, which talks about, uh, you know, understanding and, and what we can learn so beautifully from other faiths. And I think knowing that and, and showing up is crucial to not only our everyday life, but our brothers and sisters of different religions. So brothers and sisters are not just Christian, your Christian brothers and sisters, if you are Christian, it's your family and the family is the world. So we need to show up for each other. So thanks so much for your question. Sorry, just a small caveat to that. Does that include humanists, agnostics and atheists? Well, Everyone, we're, we're, we're a community together. We thrive together. We're not built, I don't think, on this world to survive. We're here to thrive and thrive in love. So um, I hope that answers your question. Fantastic. Great question, Stuart. Thanks very much for that. And um, very, very interesting, actually. So another question here is um, Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Hi, hi. Oh, hi. Father Joseph hi. from India. Yes, hi. <laughs> I, I must say, Mary, you did a fabulous job in presenting the life of Pope Francis of Assisi. Uh, you did tremendous justice. And um, I've been there to Assisi myself twice. It's one of the most beautiful places in Italy. Um, just to add to those few beautiful takeaways that you gave uh, to all of us uh, based on the life of St. Francis of Assisi, I just a thought just struck me that we are in this beautiful week of Laudato Si, which is uh, a brilliant uh, encyclical of Pope Francis on care for the earth. And probably the fifth takeaway based on the life of Francis, who was a patron of environment, is care for ecology, um, care for um, building a better world together, um, keeping in mind what's happening in our world today. So maybe that I thought could be added to to what you presented. I love that. That's a great idea. It's great to see you for all the way from yeah. India joining us. So that is wonderful. Yeah, I love you. that takeaway. That is brilliant. I'll add that in and I'll quote you for it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good to see you. Thank you, Father Joseph. So it looks Thank like you. that's the end of um, the questions. Unless anybody would like to quickly ask another question to Mary Catherine. Oh, so that seems to be there. And would you have any closing comments, Mary, Kathleen? Um, I think just uh, to thank everyone for showing up, 
I mean, I just talked about that we have to show up, right? So you all showed up today. You didn't have to come, but there's something that touched you to, to be here, to show up, to spend the time, to register, to get here, to listen. And I just want to thank you, honestly, from the bottom of my heart. It means so much to me that you were here with me as we journeyed together. And to show up for one another, um, I think, is crucial. And I heard a quote recently that said, support your friends like you support the celebrities you don't know. And I thought that was a great quote, you know? Um, and what does that mean? That means, you know, if someone, something's going on in your community and and to listen, whatever that might be, and to show up and to, to journey together. And that might be in a different faith. That might be, you know, um, a different uh, relative that you don't know that well. But it's to live simply. And by simply, I mean with kindness and with love. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much, Jed, um, for allowing me to come to speak. And I just want to thank you all so much for being here with me today. Thank you very much, Mary Catherine. It's been wonderful, really, really informative, interesting. I echo what Catherine says, the power was resonating from you. Passionate, informative, and um, the, four, the four points, the four takeaways at the end were just like fantastic. Too good. I just scribbled all those down. Um, I'll thank the people for the questions. The next, we will be back again on Saturday. We have Professor of Criminology, West Scotland University, my friend Ross Dewar, who will do a talk about gangs and spirituality. So the, the use of meditative techniques and processes to alleviate um, men of violence, men and women of extreme violence in prisons and in gang culture. So very interesting for that. And with that, I'll speak to you very soon, Mary Catherine. Hopefully you can All come right. back again soon and speak about something else. That would be great. Thank you so Thank much, you. everyone.